Welcome to our review on drugs. First thing we need to understand is what we actually mean by a drug. So when we're talking about drugs, we're talking about a chemical that's going to alter the way either your mind or your body works. Now, this may also lead to a change in behavior as well as our metabolism. Bear in mind that when we're talking about drugs, they're not all bad. There are some beneficial drugs we have um, that you can obviously go and buy to treat various illnesses, etc. And also there are some that have to be prescribed by a doctor. Now, the reason that some drugs have to be prescribed by a doctor and you can't just go and buy them in boots or in the supermarket is because some of them do have some quite serious side effects. They may interfere with other medications that you could be taking. They could be harmful if you have certain medical conditions and they may also be harmful if you take them too often. So there are some drugs that you may find are quite likely to lead to addictions. So they tend to regulate these to ensure that we can minimize those effects and make sure they're safe for those people taking them. There are some legal drugs that we use just as recreational drugs. So there's caffeine, which we're gonna find in tea, coffee, Coca-Cola, etc. We've also got nicotine, found in cigarettes and tobacco products, and we've got the alcohol as well. We need to understand three key terms before we go on to our next part. So what we'll actually find is that there are some drugs that you can become tolerant to. And by tolerance, we're actually referring to the fact that your body becomes used to the drug, so that in order to get the same effect that you used to have, you've got to take a much higher dose. Our second one is addiction, so that what we find is that if you take some of these drugs and your body does actually get used to them, then you will find that if you try not taking that drug, then your body's not going to work properly without it. And finally, the withdrawal symptoms are the symptoms that you're going to develop when you stop taking that drug. And these can be things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hallucinations, cravings. All of those are symptoms you could experience if you decide to stop using certain drugs. For people who do find themselves becoming addicted to certain drugs, then they can go into a rehabilitation program. Now, these rehabilitation programs are usually carried out in specialist hospitals or clinics, and there will be staff there that will help to support the patients in obviously going through those withdrawal symptoms that they may experience and also to help prevent them take those drugs while that period is going on. Now, what we'll find is that after a few days of not taking that drug, the withdrawal symptoms that you are experiencing will begin to fade and therefore you will hopefully find it much easier not to use the drug in the future. We need to know about the five different types of drug. So one of the common questions you'll find on your exam paper is asking you about the type of drug and its effects. Sometimes they will ask you for an example, but more often than not, it is gonna be the type of drug and linking it to the effect. So if we consider the depressants, first of all, those are things like your alcohol and solvents. And what they do is they're gonna slow down both your brain and nerve activity. So depressants slow things down. Painkillers like aspirin, paracetamol, these are gonna block nerve impulses, which means that you won't then feel that pain because it's blocking those nerve impulses that are sending that signal. The stimulants, nicotine, caffeine, ecstasy, they're gonna increase brain activity and they counteract depression. Our fourth one down, the performance enhancers, these tend to be seen more in athletes and sports people. Their example is the anabolic steroids, and the whole reason that the sports people tend to take them is because they increase muscle development. And the last one on our list, the hallucinogens, these are things like cannabis and LSD, and what they do is they distort what you see and what you hear. The depressants that we can take will actually reduce activity at the synapses. So synapses are the gaps between the two neurons that we've got to pass chemical transmitters across in order for that impulse to continue through a new neuron. And the way the depressants actually reduce this activity is by binding to the receptor molecules on that second neuron in the chain and therefore blocking the transmission. Because if we've got our actual depressant molecules bound to our receptor molecules, then that means our chemical transmitter isn't able to bind there. And as a result, the level of that chemical neurotransmitter is never going to reach the level to trigger the next impulse. 
If we consider the stimulants, however, they cause more of those transmitter substances to cross the synapse, and therefore they're going to increase the speed of those transmissions, which means that we get that increase in our brain and neurological activity. If we consider the illegal drugs now then, there are three different classes in the United Kingdom. So if we consider class A first of all, then these are the most serious if you like. So they're things like cocaine, heroin, LSD, etc. Now, if you just have possession of the drug, then you could face up to seven years in prison and an unlimited fine. If you are, however, caught dealing those drugs, then the penalties do increase considerably. So you could be looking at life imprisonment and an unlimited fine at that point. If we come down to a class B drug, then these are the second worst, if you like, the amphetamines, cannabis, strong codeine, Ritalin, for example. Then if you've got possession of the drug, then it's going to be up to five years in prison and an unlimited fine. But if you're dealing the drug, 14 years in prison and an unlimited fine. And finally, the class C drug, which are the lower classification ones, things like anabolic steroids are in this category. Then you're looking up to two years in prison and an unlimited fine if you've just got possession of them. Whereas if you are found dealing that drug, it's up to 14 years in prison and the unlimited fine. So you can see the penalties for either possession or dealing these drugs are actually quite high, which is obviously a deterrent to try to stop people from using them. Whenever we're considering any legal drugs, then before they're actually going to be licensed and allowed to be sold on the market, then they have to pass a range of different tests. So we'll carry out tests on lab animals and human tissue, and as long as they pass those, they will go through human trials to obviously find out if there are any worrying side effects or worrying effects that they hadn't turned up in the earlier stages. Assuming it passes the human trials, then the drug will get a license, and then it will be available on the market for sale. So if we consider how these drug trials are carried out in a little bit more detail, then what we're going to be using are these randomized clinical trials. And the whole purpose behind these is to see if the new drugs that have been manufactured are actually better than anything that already exists on the market, or if there are actually any significant effects, so if they're better than a placebo. And a placebo is basically a sugar pill that has absolutely no effects whatsoever. So we've got a couple of different trials that we could choose to carry out here. The blind trial is where the volunteers who are gonna be taking the drugs won't know who's actually getting the new drug and who's getting either the existing medication or the placebo. So the actual volunteers won't know, but the doctor does. In the double blind trial, neither the volunteers taking those drugs nor the doctors who are actually administering them will know who is receiving that new drug. So what this does is it avoids any bias in the results because what you could find is if the doctor knew, then they might start to hint at certain things in their questioning or their results may not be as accurate. Whereas if nobody knows who's actually got the real drug there, then there can't be any bias in their reporting. And obviously someone does know who's taking the drugs, but not within the trial itself. That's all stored separately in a very secure file. So it's all just done with clinical numbers, etc., so that no one actually on the ground in that trial knows who's getting the real drug there. We also have to consider this thing called the placebo effect, which is basically where you can have people who start to feel better just because they think they're getting a drug. So you could give someone basically a sugar pill and tell them that this is some amazing drug, tell them all of the things it's going to do for to help them feel better, etc. And some people will actually start to feel better because they think it's a real drug, even though there's nothing in there that will actually do anything of benefit.